Hey guys, this is Strength Coach Friedman with the Strength Coach Friedman Podcast. Today I'm here with my good friend, Dr. David Ackerman, who is a doctor of chiropractic. And today we're going to be talking a little bit about how chiropractic is a crucial element for improving not only your athletes in the field of strength and conditioning, but also working with uh, general people for overall optimal health. Well, thank you, Mark, for having me. And like Mark said, I'm a chiropractor. I'm also a personal trainer and a certified strength and conditioning coach. Um, And the reason why I share that with you is because I want you to understand that I believe thoroughly in the importance of strengthening and conditioning the body. And I have all the formal training that a strength coach might have in addition to an understanding on the importance of chiropractic and the role that it plays in our our health and in the, the function of our athletes. So one of the most important things that chiropractic does for athletes is it helps their bodies function properly on the inside. We're so concerned with the aesthetics and with the look of our bodies that we don't think about the internal alignment, function, and biomechanics of our bodies, of the joints, and how they work together. So when we are working with an athlete, one of the biggest things that's overlooked is the function and the alignment of their spine, and that's where chiropractors come in and play a huge role. Very true, Dre, very true. I, I agree fully. So I just want to quickly share kind of my chiropractic story and, and how I first met Dave. I actually uh, met Dave. We were working together at New York Sports Club. Um, he was a trainer that had been there for a while. I was just starting off. And um, I came to him one day with an issue about my neck. I had a question for him. So as I mentioned in previous podcasts, I used to be a pole vaulter. Just from just a couple bad landings in pole vault as well as you know, doing some training at the time when I was younger and didn't fully understand proper training and proper spinal alignment when exercising, I developed some issues in my neck. I had a severe subluxation at the base of my cervical spine. And for years, probably about six years, I went around with a literally a loose vertebrae. This vertebrae would actually wiggle when I touched it. And I had been to three different medical doctors. I'd been to a general practitioner and two orthopedics asking them, you know, what can I do for this? And their advice was, uh, just don't touch it uh, if it t- if it wiggles when you touch it. And uh, their follow-up was, we can't do anything now, but eventually we'll do surgery and we can put some rods in if it hurts. And I'm like, what? You know, I'm like a 16, 17-year-old kid, and this is what they're telling me. So I went on with severe pain in my neck and my upper trape- trapezius and levator scapulae muscles. My, my, my whole back and neck was a mess for years. I was constantly trying to stretch. I had gone to physical therapy for it, um, but really to no avail. So finally, um, working at this job, David's uh, telling me, you know, he's a chiropractor, he does this stuff. And I said, you know, Dave, I have this, uh, this vertebrae that wiggles. I said, is there anything you do about that? And he looks at me and he goes, of course. He goes, that, that's what we do. He goes, you know, if you have a tooth problem, you go to a dentist. You have, you have a problem with your, with your vertebrae being out of alignment, you go to a chiropractor. And I went to Dave that first time, and my neck has been so much better since. And I continue to see Dave for about three times a week, starting off. Um, and then I, over time, I kind of uh, weaned off a little bit. But I'm very glad that I met Dave that day, because if I hadn't, I'd probably still be having the issues with my neck Uh, that I had then today, and to be honest, I was probably on a path where I would eventually have developed uh, bulging and herniated discs and probably would have needed um, those rods in my neck just as those medical doctors said I would. So I'm very thankful to Dave uh, for meeting him uh, at that time and and asking him that question about my neck, Um, but Dave will get a little more into what chiropractic is, how it works, and what it can do for you. So taking a step back from chiropractic and speaking about the body a little more generically, as I've said in previous podcasts, joint angle dictates muscle function. The way the joints in the body align are so crucial to the proper functioning, the biomechanics of the body. If your joints are out of position, and this could be just from certain postural issues, it's going to have effect on how everything operates and functions. Poor alignment is going to equal poor function, and poor function is usually going to yield microtrauma, and ultimately uh, could yield even acute injuries. So one way to minimize the risk of injury and improve overall performance is to make sure that our joint angles are proper, our spine is in the proper alignment, a neutral spine with the proper curvatures, okay? The spine's supposed to have curves, um, but it's supposed to have the, the right curves in the right places. And by having all these things, we can make sure that we stay healthy 
and well-functioning. Remember, a joint essentially is, is the meeting place between bones. It's almost like a, a blank space, you could say. And of course, there's ligaments and tendons that, and, and the muscles that all deal and other elements of soft tissue. But, you know, think of the joint as, again, it's this almost negative space. It's, it's this place where the, where the bones meet. Um, and we need to make sure that these bones meet and line up properly in order for this joint to function properly. Uh, and I, I've said it before, the positioning of the spine, the positioning of the joints, uh, within the spine and the shoulders are so crucial uh, when training. It is impossible to do a strength and conditioning exercise properly if these joints are not in the proper alignment. The spine must be in the right spot, the scapula must be in the right spot, the pelvis must be in the right spot. And if you chronically have an issue with your spine that needs to be corrected, if you have subluxations, you cannot expect function properly. Even with, if you know the technique, even if you're doing everything right, you have the best coaching in the world, if your vertebrae are out of alignment, if your other joints are having dysfunction, you cannot properly do strength and conditioning. So I, I want to point out, um, you know, many times they say prior to starting any kind of strength and conditioning program or, or training program, you should consult a medical doctor. Um, and that's fine. Don't get me wrong. Um, I think you definitely should. Um, they're going to check things like heart rate, make, certain, make sure certain systems are functioning properly. However, medical doctors do not assess your skeletal muscular system, or at least not the ones that I've been to, unless you go in with a specific problem. Chiropractors do that, all right? At least a good chiropractor. So prior to starting any kind of training program, you know, again, if we go to a dentist every year and a medical doctor every year for a checkup, why don't we see a chiropractor every year to make sure our spine is functioning properly. So I'd recommend, and I, I recommend this to many of my clients when they come in to see me, um, the first thing I do is a postural assessment. I take a look at their posture. If they're having pain, I say, you need to get this evaluated, go to a medical doctor, and uh, if it's more joint and, and muscular related, I say, you know, make sure you see a, a chiropractor, get this evaluated, let's find out what's going on. Do you have a herniated disc? Do you have a bulging disc? What's happening? What's causing that pain? Let's get this evaluated before we start a training program. And even for individuals who aren't necessarily experiencing pain, I always recommend going to a chiropractor to get evaluated first just so we know what's going on, especially if I see anything weird. Um, if it looks like they have dropped shoulders, an anterior pelvic tilt, any kind of rotation of the pelvis, in those sense, uh, those are dysfunction. Maybe they're not causing pain yet, but those are all going to be things that are going to create a problem within the strength and conditioning program. And over time, if you continually put this stress on a dysfunctional system, the system will collapse. So I always like to take the preventative stance. Let's prevent a problem before it forms. And always make sure that you get the proper assessments and know what's happening in your body before adding external stress to that body. So I blabbed long enough. Um, I'm going to have Dave talk a little bit about uh, the history of chiropractic. So Dave, what is chiropractic in your own words? And could you give us a little bit of the history of, of how chiropractic started and the direction you see it going? Absolutely. Well, chiropractic in itself means by hands only. And it was developed by D.D. Palmer, or I should say discovered by D.D. Palmer, who was a magnetic healer at the time and he was doing hands-on work with his his patients and he was using magnets to help move energy through the body and, and that was what he was using to help people at the time and one day he was walking with a janitor by the name of Harvey Lillard who was at the time legally deaf uh, we didn't have a diagnosis for it because it, the medicine wasn't what it was today but he couldn't hear he was hard of hearing and D.D. Palmer was talking to him or making a joke and he slapped him on the back at some point as like a gesture of of laughing and a huge pop occurred in his neck in Harvey Lillard's neck and automatically he can hear again so that was that was an amazing moment for not just Harvey but for chiropractic because it was that moment that chiropractic was discovered and Dee Dee being the healer that he was said to himself there must be something here there must be a connection between the neck where I just hit this person and their hearing so sure enough Dee Dee's son whose name is BJ Palmer was the person who then took this information and developed chiropractic he's the one who did all the research and, and dissected tens of 
of maybe even hundreds of cadavers. They have one of the most um, comprehensive anatomy uh, labs in the, in the country, in the, the School of Palmer in, in Davenport, Iowa, because of all the dissections that BJ did. And what they discovered is there is, in fact, a connection between the ears and the neck, and that it was the movement of a bone at a place that relieved the pressure on the nerve that went to his ear and allowed him to hear again. So we've come a long way now, fast forward over 100 years later, and the research has been piled up to the point where we've been able to prove the efficacy of chiropractic beyond just getting people's hearing back if, if it's a bone out of place causing their hearing. We've now learned that there is the chance for all the bones in the spine to either come out of alignment or not function and move properly. And we, we coined that term subluxation. So earlier you heard Mark explain that he had a subluxation in his neck, that bone that was wiggling. And he came to me three times a week for a period of time after we found that bone. So you might be thinking to yourself, well, that's exactly what I was afraid of. Chiropractors, you go in for one problem, and next thing you know, they're telling you to come in three times a week forever. And the reality is, when you go to a dentist and they check your mouth because you had a cavity, and you've never been to the dentist before, you're, you're going to expect that they're going to do a comprehensive dental exam, and they're going to work on the, the health of your entire mouth, not just that one tooth. And that's what we did with Mark. So when he came in, not only did we help the subluxation in his neck, but we did a comprehensive total body exam, and we found out that there were other areas of misalignment because he's a, a, an amazing athlete. He was doing track at the time, and he had caused some major imbalances from years of, of athletics and not getting adjusted. So we worked on not just adjusting his neck, but adjusting the rest of his body so that everything can function properly because as an athlete we need the bones to be aligned properly and the joints to be getting proper nerve supply so that everything is working and firing on all eight cylinders. So that is, that is what chiropractic has developed into over the years. It started with a discovery and now it's something that we're, we're understanding is a optimal part of our health. Just like we know we need to eat healthy, you need to exercise, you need to get enough sleep, we need to be positive, we need to think positive thoughts, we need to read and educate our minds. We also need to work on our spines and keep them healthy and keep them in alignment. And that's where chiropractic plays an essential role in our health and in our strength training for our athletes and for ourselves. So Dave, we, we hear a lot of terms thrown around by people these days um, that I think really tie in with, with what chiropractic is. Um, we hear things like, oh, I got a pinched nerve in my neck, or, oh, I have a slipped disc. Can you explain, I guess, a little more uh, scientifically what, what these things really are and, and what's happening in the body that, that's causing these things? I think, as you mentioned, that individual essentially had a, some sort of pinched nerve. Now, maybe it wasn't uh, the individual that was uh, a deaf until the uh, subluxation was corrected. Was that, is that what was occurring? Was there a pinched nerve, essentially, and the shifting alleviated that and restored the hearing? Yes. So what usually is, is occurring when there's a, a bone out of place or a, a slip disc is that there is pressure on the nerve, whether it's coming from the, the bone itself, the disc, or most, most often it's inflammation that results in the misalignment complex in itself. And that's really on a scientific level what's happening. You know, it's not that the bone is shifting so far out of place that it's, it's physically noticeable to some people. It's more of the fact that the, the, the bone itself is not moving and gliding properly and therefore it's creating inflammation because it's not functioning and that inflammation is what's affecting the surrounding nerves and discs and causing pain and that's where the symptoms come on. So with uh, Harvey Lillard there was a there's a nerve that goes to the ear, the vestibular cochlear nerve and that's one of the nerves that's affected from the, the, the brain stem right at the level of C2, which is the vertebrae in your neck. And that's one of the connections that we've now found with our hearing and that has to do with chiropractic. Um, and very commonly when people have quote unquote slip discs, it's not that the disc is slipping out and it needs to be put back in. If you have a, a slip disc, that's a herniated disc. That means that the, the nucleus pulposus, which is that soft jelly, has come out of the annulus fibrosus, which is the hard outer part of the disc. And usually when that happens, the jelly is not coming back inside the donut unless you do something to change the alignment of the spine and the weight distribution and the pressure on that disc. And once again, it all comes back to restoring the normal curvatures into the spine 
and restoring the proper movement patterns with these people because if you're in alignment but you're not moving properly you're going to be causing weight imbalances and pressure on the nerves and discs and that's where even the best chiropractic adjustment can't fix that so that's where mark comes in and he's he's an expert in teaching people how to move properly and how to keep the body in alignment once i do the adjustments to put them into alignment that uh well said well said um so like, like you mentioned, um, the slip disc is kind of a generic term usually referring to um, a herniated disc. But, but prior to a herniated disc, do you usually uh, have a bulging disc? And I guess, um, c- can you explain a little bit of, of the progression of the uh, disc and spinal degeneration? So, so what usually, you know, how does a subluxation many times occur? And then once it's subluxed, What's the progression of spinal deformity and degeneration all the way into some of these end-stage things when people actually need to get serious surgery and, and have rods put in? Absolutely. Well, how does subluxation occur? We're probably, we're all causing some form of subluxation right now even. You know, Mark and I are sitting down and, um, you know, we're, we're trying to get close to this microphone. So we're, we're sitting with our heads forward in front of our shoulders. Our shoulders are rounded forward. We're, we're losing the normal curvatures of the spine as it is at this moment. And it's, it's, <laughs> it's, similar, it's similar to how most people sit at their computers all day or in their cars all day. And what that does is it puts the body in a compromised position where the bones are not in their normal alignment. And over time, the bones can start to shift out of, out of alignment into that position, and that becomes their new permanent position. That changes the weight bearing on the disc, which the disc is not designed to bear weight. The disc is a shock absorber. It's a buffer in case of emergency, not to constantly hold the entire weight of your body uh, over time. So what happens is if the body is out of alignment and it's not corrected, it continues to wear down at the disc and causes degeneration, which is deterioration of the disc until the point where the, the inner material starts to leak out and that is a disc herniation. Before it it herniates, the material will press up against the outsides and the disc will bulge. Kind of like if you take a stress ball in your hand and you squeeze it, you'll notice that the material starts to bulge to the outsides and that's essentially what a disc bulge would be. So these are all common injuries that we hear about all the all the time that it, you know I don't need to see a chiropractor I just have a bulging disc or I just have a, a herniated disc it's not a chiropractic problem it's a disc problem and the reality is if it's a disc problem it's a spinal problem and if it's a spinal problem it's a chiropractic problem <laughs> and if it's a chiropractic problem it's probably a lifestyle problem because there's more than just your spine that that chiropractors essentially deal with we also talk about your movement your your posture we deal with muscular imbalances we talk about nutrition and all the other factors that that play a role in what caused the disc to bulge essentially in the first place and eventually you know some of these bulging discs and, and herniated discs this can lead to an actual um, if the disc becomes so compressed can this then lead to arthritis in the spine where the, where the vertebrae actually start to rub together and that's usually when like a, a major surgery would have to be done Absolutely. And that's the biggest problem that I find is when people do have these issues and they do go to the orthopedist and the medical doctors, the orthopedist and medical doctors look at their x-rays and they say, well, it's just arthritis. It's just age related. There's nothing you can really do about it. Uh, Maybe they send you to physical therapy. Maybe they prescribe you uh, muscle relaxers or just tell you to rest. But the reality is that's more of a reaction based approach it's too late at that point the damage has already been done and uh, medical doctors are not trained in the biomechanics and the movement of the body like chiropractors are like strength coaches are so when they look at this they're not seeing it as the the reason behind what caused the arthritis and they don't make that connection for the person so people leave the office doing the same things they were doing that got them into that situation causing the arthritis they never change anything and maybe they get out of pain but as time goes on, the body continues to degenerate, more and more arthritis builds up until it might actually require a surgical approach or rods or something even worse. And I, I keep hearing about these surgeries, and I've worked with um, several clients over the years that have had rods put in. I know a lot of young people today that are getting rods put in. Um, in, in the case of some of these 
younger individuals, you know, teenagers that have such bad scoliosis that they need to undergo these severe spinal surgeries, um, I, I tend to think that some of these subluxations are, are occurring from somewhere. Um, and I know we've discussed before that, that this can actually occur from the, from the birthing process. Um, it, it's come to my attention that people, uh, women, w- when they're giving birth, they're actually meant to be in a squatted position. Back in the day, this is how women gave birth. They, they just squatted down wherever they were, just like uh, how people would go to the bathroom, and they would uh, deliver the baby. There was no doctor that was pulling on the baby, getting it out, and women were most certainly not laying on their backs with their feet up on pedals. Um, I actually heard that the the initial the, the, the system currently used today for, for delivering babies um, in which a woman lays on a table was actually had nothing to do with anatomical um, correctness. It had to do with a, a king, uh, one of the King Henrys, I believe, uh, apparently was a bit of a pervert and had a bit of a weird fetish where he used to like to watch women giving birth. And that's how it all started. And from there, the doctor said, hey, this is kind of easy. You know, it's, it's easier for us to be in that position. Um, and they just continued. But because women are giving birth in this position, they're not working with gravity, nor are they working with the biomechanical structure of the human body. They're working against both of these. And it seems that doctors have to use a lot more uh, force and a lot more tools to actually get the baby out of the womb. And this could possibly be leading to, uh, you know, some of the issues. So, Dave, you know, what, what's your comment on this? Do you, do you feel that these, sub- these subluxations that are occurring at birth are, are stemming from the practices um, that some of these medical doctors are using? And can some of these things be corrected at an early age with chiropractic to prevent you know, 16-year-old girls from having to undergo severe spinal surgery? So that's a great question. And to, to answer that question, I want to just go back a little bit to the mother and before she has her child. So to talk about the, the, the function of the nervous system and the role that it plays in pregnant women, the nerves are what tell the uterus when to contract and help the actual process of delivering the child. It's a reflex if you think about it. It's a natural occurrence that, that you really don't have any control over as a woman other than to push and to breathe, but the body takes over and it does this on its own and it's a beautiful thing. Well, now in, in modern times, we've either picked a day to deliver a child, not even giving the body a chance to deliver it, or we are not priming the bodies to do this natural occurrence on its own meaning that women, if they're subluxated in their lower regions, they're not going to be getting the proper nerve supply to their uterus and to the muscles around their pelvis. So when the child is actually ready to be born, it's not going to make those connections. The synapses are not going to be there to cause the reflexes at the right time. And it's kind of like the equivalent to being constipated, right? You're pushing, but nothing's happening because the nerves are not firing and the body is not doing what it needs to do to move things along. So to Mark's point, the position that we're putting women in is counterproductive if you think about it. If you're trying to get something out of the body, why would you lay on your back and work against gravity when you can be upright and let gravity gravity, and the body's natural reflex to take over? And that, to me, is essentially a natural way of delivering the child. So now we've put women in a position where they're not, they're not prepared to have a, a, a healthy delivery or a medical-free, interference-free delivery we usually numb them with epidurals. So now their nerves are completely cut off and they can't even have the, the baby naturally if they tried because there's no connection between the nerves and the uterus. And we use forceps and we use instruments to, to pull and yank on the child's head and twist and turn to get them out of the birth canal instead, which that force is enough to sometimes break the child's clavicle when they're trying to pull them out of the birth canal. So you can only imagine the potential for misalignment that's happening at such an early age. And that's where, to Mark's point about what can be prevented, if the atlas, which is the first bone in your spine, it's right up in the base of your skull, in between your ears, if that bone gets twisted out of position, the other 23 bones are going to form out of alignment because they're all forming underneath like dominoes. So now you think about the scoliosis that are so bad, these children have rods put in their spines. Could it be from a forced delivery? I don't have the answer for that, 
to say yes or no, black or white, but it's definitely some food for thought. Excellent. Yes. Uh, very good point. You know, you never really know what, what's causing things. Um, but these are definitely things that, that, that could be factors, you know, and it's, and it's good to look at all the different factors, look at all the evidence, and then try to figure out the best things, you know, for us to do to, to stay healthy as a, as a society. Um, so you mentioned a little bit about the, the atlas bone. Could you talk a little bit more about the curves of the spine and the different segments of the spine? And, and I think, you know, people, they say things, oh, yeah, I got a herniation. I go, okay, well, what, what disc is herniated? And they're like, oh, I don't know, you know, uh, see something? And they don't really even know what this means. So and I think the average person doesn't really know much about the spine, and I think when they do go for x-rays and MRIs, this usually really isn't well explained to them. So could you just talk a little bit about uh, the, the spinal anatomy real quick? Absolutely. So spinal anatomy, if you think about the spine, it should really look like a, almost like a seahorse where you have a curve in your neck like a banana. The middle back should be going the opposite way of your neck curve, and your lower back should be curving in the same direction of your neck. And these curves are essential because they support the weight of your body. Your, your, your spine itself can hold an enormous amount of weight, and the discs are there to just buffer the weight when you come out of these curves. And that's when we get into trouble. So when people have herniated discs, there's a very good chance that they have a misalignment in their spine and that's compressing the disc and that's what's causing the herniation. And once we restore the normal curves back to the spine, we can take the pressure off those discs and prevent any future injury. So just to get a little more scientific, the, the neck uh, segment, that is considered the cervical spine, correct? And that contains seven? vertebrae and then we have the thoracic spine which is the part where the rib cages attach uh, or the, the ribs attach and form the rib cage um, and then from there you get the lumbar spine and that's that curved lower back um, and then technically we have the the sacral spine which is the sacrum and then and that's what attaches to the well it's part of the pelvis um, and then we have the coccyx or tailbone correct yes. but those those bottom vertebrae are non-articulating so there's usually about 33 vertebrae sometimes people get 31 or 34 or 32 or 34 but they're not all articulating correct right so so like mark is saying when we're born we have more we have more vertebrae because the sacrum has five segments that then fuse over time as we get older uh, so that's where we end up with uh, 24 at the end of the at the end of the adult uh, fusion when we when we're fully developed with the seven cervical 12 thoracic and 5 lumbar and then you also have the pelvis which is made up of the ilium the ischium the pubis bone and then the sacrum and the coccyx so these bones all work together and the the biggest part of it is I, I explained to patients is it makes up your spine it's it's essentially one unit at the end of it all it's just like your teeth right you, you don't think of your teeth as as one tooth uh, compared to another when you brush your teeth you brush all of them so when you go to a chiropractor we check your entire spine we want to make sure that everything is working together and if you have a subluxation in your back it can affect your neck because it's all connected it's a it's a chain link if you will and that's where chiropractors look at the the whole body body and how it all functions together. So an issue I hear a lot of people having um, these days is sciatica. And from my understanding, this sometimes relates a little bit to the SI joint, the sacroiliac joint. Um, so you can talk a little bit about, you know, what the sacroiliac joint is, how it functions uh, in terms of strength and conditioning. I know it, there is movement in that joint. That's why it's not totally fused. And that very little bit of movement is actually quite crucial for the transfer of energy when generating um, rotational power in the transverse plane. So if you could talk a little bit about the SI joint and then I guess some of the related issues or, or unrelated issues as well stemming with uh, or stemming from sciatica. Absolutely. So like Mark said, sciatica is one of the biggest uh, problems that we have with athletes and, and just people in general. Uh, and a lot of it, I believe, stems from two things. From one, the fact that we sit way more than we were designed to sit and two that we don't have the proper hip mobility and glute activation that we need and it all really comes back to the same first problem which is sitting so the the, the si joint is the sacroiliac joint it's the joint between the sacrum and the ilium so think of it as your where your tailbone meets your hip bones and then you have your sciatic nerve exiting out between those two bones and there's a, a muscle that 
tra that travels across between the two bones as well, which is the piriformis muscle. So this, this is almost like a Bermuda Triangle, if you will, because it's where a lot of different bones and, and nerves and muscles come together. And if you factor in that we sit all day, which potentially causes subluxation in this joint, or it can create movement inefficiencies in this joint, uh, it's also going to set us up for other imbalances elsewhere. So it really, in athletes, becomes a potential huge problem when we're trying to do compound movements that n involve the SI joint, because if the SI joint is not aligned properly or the muscles around it aren't firing properly, then when you try to do a compound movement, whether it's a squat, a deadlift, or even a rotational movement, which definitely involves the SI joint, then you're going to have irritation on the joint itself and ultimately the sciatic nerve, which exits out of the joint. And when the sciatic nerve is aggravated, it becomes inflamed, which is going to be very painful and it's called sciatica. From the, from the strength and conditioning perspective, the ability to generate power in the lower body and then transfer that, that force, that energy, up to the upper torso is so crucial for so many sports. Um, many of our striking sports, uh, martial arts, you know, MMA, boxing, um, as well as any sport that requires quick movements um, or kicking, you know, football, soccer, this part of the body is, is so crucial and being able to have that proper hip lockout and that proper transfer of energy within the sacroiliac joint really is an important factor for making sure that you don't have energy leaks, making sure that energy flows effectively. So when we do exercises like the Olympic lifts, granted this is more in the you know, sagittal plane, so there's not as much of a rotational factor, well, no rotational factor really, um, it, it, it still comes in with the same process. If there is dysfunction in that part of the body, the pelvic floor is so important. Um, making sure the muscles around the pelvis, the pelvic floor, um, these, a lot of people don't even think of activating the, the, the PC muscles and the other pelvic floor muscles, uh, or the, the muscles around the pelvis, I should say, um, when they do exercises. But when you're squatting, you should actually be trying to activate the pelvic floor because that is a, a crucial muscle that ties in with the functionality of everything else we, that we do, uh, especially for those more explosive movements um, like the Olympic lifts. So. When doing the Olympic lifts, you want to make sure you're creating that proper intra-abdominal pressure and that proper activation of the muscles around and within the pelvis in order for to create the proper energy and make sure the energy from the lower body transfers up. But if we have different dysfunctions in that part of the body, if you have a rotated pelvis, a pelvis that's slanted, your SI joint is out of alignment, this is all going to interfere with your ability to generate power. So again, many times as strength coaches, you know, we look at the output. We go, okay, well, this person can do this much weight, so that means they must be functioning this well. However, if there are these subtle issues within the body, you're going to have massive energy leaks, and you can also be doing a lot of damage because these joints are not properly functioning. You know, the, the, the whole idea of, uh, you know, old age, oh yeah, when you get too old, your joints wear down. Well, that's not necessarily true. Um, granted, yes, as you get older, there's greater you know, the, the, the body loses some of its resiliency. I will agree with that. But there's plenty of people that are in their 30s and they're suffering from issues in their knees that some people in their 70s and 80s don't even have. So then it starts to beg the question, is it so much the age that's the only factor or is it how long you've been doing something wrong? Because if you've been doing something wrong for 30 years and someone's been doing something right for 80 years, like the, the shaman that I met in the forest, you know, this guy was able to squat no problem at 84 years old because he had been doing it and his body functioned properly. And then I have people that are in their 20s and 30s that can't even squat because, not because of old age, because they're not that old, but because they've been doing something wrong for that long. So it's very important to make sure that we, again, not only do corrective exercises to make sure the body functions and balance um, muscularly, but also with the spine. So it's very important to make sure that all these things are flowing properly for that proper energy transfer and to really make sure that you're an elite athlete. So another topic that I kind of wanted to discuss a little bit regarding chiropractic is the way chiropractic is perceived by the medical industry and, and other ind individuals. Every so often you kind of hear negative people having negative experiences with chiropractors, and I'm sure, you know, there are instances when this can happen, but this can happen in any field. You know, you hear about lots of medical doctors 
cutting off the wrong leg. You know, they're going to do an amputation, they take the right leg instead of the left leg. And this has actually become such a frequent thing where they actually had to create protocol where both the doctor and the patient have to sign the leg prior to the surgery occurring just to make sure that the wrong one wasn't taken off. So unfortunately, things can always go wrong in, in any field. And unfortunately, I think we sometimes tend to focus on the people that are screwing up and not the people that are leading the field in a positive direction. So Dave, kind of, what's your thought on this um, with chiropractic? Uh, how do people perceive it? Why are they perceiving it this way? And you know, what, why are they creating these, these misconceptions? Well, it's definitely something I'm glad you asked because chiropractic is one of the safest of the health professions. And we all go to school just like any other doctor to help people. And we help people with our, our hands, with our knowledge, with our ability to educate them on their bodies and how their bodies function and how their bodies heal naturally without medication. So when it comes to chiropractic, essentially, it's one of the safest of the health professions there is. We don't do, we don't do surgery, so we're not cutting off the wrong leg. We don't prescribe medication, so there's no potential side effects. And the, the media is what gives chiropractic a bad rap when they, they try to blow out of proportion a, a, an occurrence that might have happened that involved the chiropractor. And a lot of the times, even when they say something like, okay, chiropractor manipulations can cause stroke, well, first, there's no proof whatsoever that there's any correlation between a single chiropractic adjustment and a single stroke that's ever been performed. So that's the first misconception. What happens is it's great media and it's great because the medical community doesn't like chiropractic because what we're doing is getting patients away from medicine and we're getting them off of their drugs and, and we're preventing them from having surgeries. So they're looking at us as people who are, who are taking away their potential patients. And the media loves a good chiropractic story because everyone is waiting for something bad to happen so they can point the finger and say, see, we told you it's, it's not safe or we told you it doesn't work. But the reality is chiropractic has been around for over 100 years. Hundreds of thousands of people go to chiropractors every day and get adjusted and not a single bad thing happens. What I want to talk about is all the amazing stories that happen from people going to chiropractic and why don't we hear more of that? So that is really what I think needs to happen. We need to focus more on the positive and all of the amazing things that are happening from people getting under chiropractic care, getting adjusted, how if you go to a chiropractor, you're more inclined to then feel better, t stop taking your medication, join a gym, start exercising, then enroll a, an actual health practitioner who can teach you the proper way to exercise so you're more likely to succeed and not get discouraged and ultimately change your entire lifestyle, which is gonna add years to your life and life to your years. So that's what I think about the importance of chiropractic. It's really saving people's lives if you think of it in a long-term perspective. And maybe if that's a little extreme, at the very least, it is enhancing the quality of people's lives with no doubt. Very good, very good. So real quick, could you go a little more, uh, you know, we talked about the spine, we talked about kind of the theory of chiropractic, how it operates, how it, how it works, the, the anatomy and physiology of the body. Can you go a little bit into the, spe the specific techniques that are utilized both by yourself and, and other chiropractors to actually, you know, take care of the patient? So, so when a patient walks in on the first day, how do you start things off? What do you do? And when you create that treatment program, you know, in, in your scope of practice, what kind of things do you do to actually get this person functioning, get, get their skeleton back to where it needs to be? Our exam is a very thorough exam where we do a complete medical history, comprehensive evaluation. We do their vitals. We take their blood pressure. Just like any other medical office, we're, we're looking to make sure that there's no health concerns and that it's completely safe to be working with this person and that we don't have to refer them out to an emergency room or something of the sort. And once we've completed our comprehensive exam, we then go to our spinal exam where I do a postural assessment. I do a standing assessment and as well as a, a, a prone and supine assessment. I go through all their ranges of motion, both in their spine and in their upper and lower extremities. I look for muscular imbalances. I look for scoliosis and any other potential spinal issues that they could be dealing with. 
Uh, we do x-rays if necessary to visualize the bones and rule out any fractures or arthritis or, or bone cancers or anything of the sort. And then after we do a scan on the computer, which is called a, a surface electromyography, which picks up electrical activity from the spine, from the nerves, and points out areas where there's potential subluxation. From there, if we find any potential subluxation, I do my hands-on exam and find the, feel the bones and, and do some chiropractic uh, palpation to see if the bone itself is moving properly and if there's any chance that the, the biomechanics are off or there's, there's maybe a subluxation of that bone in particular. And after we've completed that part of the exam, we scan their feet to see how their, their feet are aligned and if they have flat feet or if they have one foot that has more weight on it than the other, which is a strong indicator of subluxation elsewhere in the body. And these are all things that are done on the first visit before we even think about doing an adjustment for a person. So by the time we adjust our patients, we have a better understanding of their health, of their body, of their spine, and what is the ultimate underlying cause of their pain and their problem and it's just a matter of then implementing the right types of adjustments and the right types of stretches and exercises to correct these imbalances and we use all of the the state-of-the-art equipment from the uh, motorized adjusting tables in the office to the you know, electrical um, tools that we use to help move the bones and and stimulate the muscles where we need to uh, work on the muscles as well and of course, not to discount the power of our hands, of the human touch. As advanced as we get, we never want to lose touch with what chiropractic is and what it means, which is by hands only. So we always want to make sure that every one of our patients gets that human experience because at the end of the day, medicine is taking away that human experience and that is where a lot of the healing occurs. So when you use your hands on some individuals to reset the bone to the proper alignment, uh, I, I think this is one thing that a lot of people kind of are a little bit afraid about when, when they think about going to a chiropractor. It's that, like, you know, movie sound, you know, the guy taking taking your head in the hands and cracking the neck, and people hear that, that crack, and I think it, it frightens some people. For me, you know, I, I love it. I look forward to that sound. It, it, to me, it, it signifies the, the proper alignment and, and the release of the tension. Can you explain a little bit about what's actually causing that sound when, when that cracking occurs and, you know, why you're, you're not breaking their neck, you're, you're fixing the neck, but, but what's actually happening um, to create that, that noise? Well, the noise itself is just the release of nitrogen gas. So it, it is as simple as if you ever had that packing material and you would pop the packing material and you're hearing the popping noises, but it's really just air or gas being released. And what happens is when you when the bones shift out of alignment, they draw air, they draw nitrogen gas into the joint, and then when we push the bones gently back into alignment, we're pushing the gas out of the joint, and that's what creates that popping sound. And of course, you know, the movements of the vertebrae are quite subtle. I, I think people get a little, you know, you watch a video, or you, again, you see you see something on TV, people get a little bit frightened by it. You know, I, I think that's, from people I've spoken to, that seems to be one of the concerns. But, you know, at the end of the day, that doesn't have to be something that you get done. You know, I know for a while, uh, my mom, who, who also sees Dave for chiropractic treatments, she doesn't, she, you know, for a long time, she was afraid to get her neck adjusted. And instead, she had just, you know, the parts of the body that she wanted adjusted, adjusted, you know, the lower back and the thoracic spine. So if you are going to go to a chiropractor and you do have certain concerns, that's okay. Talk to them. And I'm sure the chiropractor, you know, at the end of the day, it's for you. So I'm sure the chiropractor will be happy to adjust their treatment to fit your needs. You know, whatever your comfort level is, I'm sure they can do it. They'll do what you need them to do or want them to do when you're ready. Uh, now, I know at this point, I believe my mom does get the, the neck adjustments. So she's kind of gone to a point where she's comfortable with that. Um, but, you know, it, it's you kind of got to there is an element of trust. You know, you have to kind of develop that, that rapport with your chiropractor because they are putting hands on your body and adjusting you. And for some people, that trust issue is sometimes, I think, a concerning thing. But some chiropractors do a great job, you know, building that trust. I know Dave is one of them. You know, Dave has a whole kind of network that he's built, this chiropractic practice and the different activities that he does. You want to talk a little bit about that, about, you know, kind of how you do things here and kind of your whole uh, active team? I would love to. Yes. Well, 
we definitely like Mark was saying, we work on building rapport with our patients. It's it's something that is so important to have that level of trust when you're dealing with someone who's going to be guiding you for for years with your health. And in order to, to do that, I, I want people to really see that that what we're recommending is also something that I do for myself. And not only do I get adjusted on a regular basis, I also exercise daily and I do all the stretches and exercises that I prescribe to my patients as well. And we, we promote an active lifestyle. That's, that's here what we're really trying to do. So with the, the active team, it's something that, that I came up with a few years ago that I thought was absolutely necessary. And it was a way to get my patients up and moving and doing things they wouldn't normally do on their own because whatever excuse they might have, whether it's because of the pain or because they're afraid of injuring themselves or they just don't know what to do, and I've created a, uh, a monthly event where every month we do different events and they're always free and they're put on by my office and we've done yoga, Pilates, we've done strength training classes, we've done uh, water balloon workouts, you name it, we've probably done it. And uh, the idea is to give them a variety of things they can do to just help them move and help them become healthier and just to get up and get, and get active. So that's where chiropractic to me is, is more than just moving people's bones back into alignment. It's teaching them what to do and how to do it after you've aligned them. I, I agree fully, Dave. I tend to see chiropractic as one piece of the pie. I feel when you, when you have a balanced, healthy body and mind um, and spirit, if you want to throw that in, there is a balance. You know, if you're, if you're an athlete and you need to operate at an optimal level of function, you need a, a full balanced training system. Um, you know, I th- think a lot of people, you know, some people they go to chiropractors and they're like, oh, you know, I just don't feel that it works. And for those people that they don't really feel it's working, it's because they're not doing the work that they have to do themselves. You, you can't expect to go to a personal trainer once every other week, work out for an hour, and magically have this amazing transformation of your body. It's not going to happen. You have to do the work. A personal trainer, they're the guide, okay? A coach, they can guide you. They can train you. They they can do so much. But if you go home and the rest of the time that you don't spend with them, you're not doing what you need to do, you're not going to get to the level that you want to be. And the same goes, I think, for chiropractic. They can adjust the bones. They can put things back. But if you keep going back to sitting in inappropriate positions, if you keep you know, failing to, to make the change in your day-to-day activity, you're going to unfortunately sometimes revert, you know. So the way I see it, if you really want to bring a change to your to your spine, your overall health, you need to see the chiropractor for those adjustments. You need to do the proper soft tissue work to make sure that the tissues are functioning properly. You're relieving yourself of any myofascial degradation and trigger points because sometimes I think these trigger points can kind of pull bones out of alignment this overactive muscle and sometimes I think the bone being alignment can pull on these muscles and create trigger points so it's kind of this chicken and the egg thing so the adjustments are great and they're very beneficial I personally found the most success when I was getting adjusted, when I would integrate this in. So I was doing my soft tissue work. It means I was foam rolling. I was using uh, lacrosse balls and tennis balls to do different soft tissue work. You know, do that. You, we can do another podcast on uh, talking about soft tissue. I don't want you just jumping into something and, and causing an issue. You, you need to know how to do it properly. But, you know, gently using a foam roller or using your thumb to gently massage certain trigger points can be good. Going for a massage or going to someone that practices cupping or acupuncture, you know, different soft tissue techniques can all be, or, or um, the, uh, what's a technique that you do with the, the metal tools? Graston. The Graston technique and other scraping techniques. I know I have a couple little plastic tools I got on my travels abroad that are used in common practice um, in places like Thailand and Vietnam in, in the Southeast, uh, Southeast Asia. They, they do these things all the time. You know, parents do this. I and my grandfather, his mother used to do cupping on him all the time. Cupping is can either be a plastic cup that gets pumped up or a glass cup, or kind of a glass bowl that gets heated and creates a vacuum. And you put that on the skin and it kind of pulls the skin into the bowl. Um, if you notice, I think at the last Olympics, Michael Phelps had those like circular suction cup looking things on his shoulder. That's from the cupping technique. So I think you need to integrate some soft tissue work in too. I think doing your exercises, I think having proper 
dynamic warm-ups. I, I sometimes call them corrective exercises, but at the same time, I think all exercises you should be doing should be correct. So we really shouldn't even have to say it's corrective. Uh, if, if you're doing an incorrect exercise, then you, you just probably shouldn't be doing it. So doing exercises to not only mobilize the body properly, static stretches to improve proper flexibility at the right times. Remember, we want to do this more post-workout and just having the proper strengthening exercises so that once you got your spine in the right position, you're strengthening those muscles. You're getting them to activate properly in that position. And I know, Dave, you have a lot of your patients hop on the vibrational platform post-adjustment to get those muscles firing, get those nerve endings firing and causing those muscles to contract involuntarily to kind of um, cement uh, the, the adjustment that's just taken place. So I really, I'm, I'm a believer in chiropractic. Do I think it's a magic fix? No, nothing is, all right? Anyone that tries to sell you on some magic fix, whether it's a personal training program or, or some fancy method, there is no magic fix. But if you have the proper balance of these different systems and you integrate them properly, you can have magical results, all right? So there's no magic fix, but you can really get great results if you have this proper balance of, of everything together. So one thing I want to talk about real quick is some of the specific spinal deformities that can come about. So we talked a little bit about scoliosis and issues with that, but I want to have Dave talk a little bit about forward head posture. So when the cervical spine kind of loses its natural curvature, and a little bit about lower cross syndrome, so that anterior, severe anterior pelvic tilt. We can also talk about the posterior pelvic tilt and how that affects the spine, why some people, you know, get pain in their backs when they're squatting, and, you know, you hear people like, oh, I threw up my back and all these things. You know, was that really an isolated incident, or was that just finally an acute occurrence from years and years of dysfunction and problems that have been going on in that body. So Dave, you just talk a little bit about some of those uh, imbalances and how you remedy them. Sure. Well, Mark was uh, saying, starting with, with uh, forward head posture, one of the most common issues we see when the cervical lordosis is lost and you lose that curve in the neck, not only does it put the head in a dangerous position, causing pressure on the nerves that go to the head, causing headaches, pressure on the nerves that go to the arm and shoulders, causing uh, carpal tunnel and pinch nerves into the into the arms. It can definitely affect the, the contractility of a muscle. So for an athlete, it can affect their strength output. It can affect their ability to contract the muscles. Their coordination can be delayed if they have subluxation of their cervical spine. So these are all things that must be corrected. From a scoliosis perspective, when you lose the cervical lordosis and you lose that curvature of the spine, it's a dangerous thing because then it opens up the vertebrae to start deviating to the right and to the left and also allowing them to rotate, which is the beginnings of a scoliosis. So in other words, if you want to prevent your spine from becoming curved in the wrong ways, you need to get the correct curves in the right ways. Uh, I'll say that again. If you want to prevent your spine from curving in the wrong ways, you need to put the correct curves in the right way. So that's essential when it comes to the neck and the curves of your spine. And lastly, lower cross syndrome. We're, we all are guilty of it. We sit all day more than we're designed to sit. And getting back to almost how women are delivering children the wrong way, we're also sitting the wrong way. We weren't designed to sit on these static chairs. We'd be getting eaten alive right now by some wild bear or something if we were to sit in the same position for more than a, an hour at a time. And what happens is when we're sitting, we're in a, in a hip flex position. Our hip flexors become... Uh, contracted and shortened and then our lower back our erector spinae muscles overactivate which creates this this imbalance so now these muscles are are tight and then they shut off the opposing muscles so our glute maximus cannot fire and our transverse abdominus cannot fire and those muscles are the supportive muscles that we need to keep our trunk upright like mark was saying earlier transverse abdominus makes up the part of your pelvic floor and without that you can't ex you can't perform an explosive movement and without your glutes then you can't do anything because the glutes are the largest, most powerful muscle of your body. And without your glutes, you can't perform as an athlete. You can't even get up out of your seat without your glutes. So lo lower cross syndrome is something that we see every day. The best correction for it, first you have to start off by releasing those tight or inhibited muscles, the hip flexors and the, and the lower back erector spinae. 
Second, I would also r recommend to not overlook the structural component, the alignment of the pelvis, the alignment of the spine. So please don't think that you can correct these things without consulting a chiropractor as well, because there is a structural component like we just talked about in this podcast. And lastly, you have to activate the inhibited muscles. You have to do exercises to get those glutes firing and do breathing exercises to get that transverse abdominus muscle firing. And, and do your due diligence to prevent lower cross syndrome from reoccurring because just after correcting it doesn't guarantee that it's never going to reoccur again if you're sitting all day or you're moving with poor, uh, poor uh, aware, awareness. You know, if you're not aware or if you're not, if you're not uh, being conscious of your posture while you're moving, it's very possible to resort back to your old alignment. You know, again, I, I can't stress the importance of structure, structural alignment, and posture. Posture, not only is it such a, an important thing aesthetically, um, you know, if, if you're an individual and just the, the, way we, the way we look, the way we carry ourselves uh, really affects what people perceive us. So if you're hunched and your head's forward, there's certain negative connotations that society is already going to build just when they look at you just from that. Um, let alone the, the health-related issues, and that's probably where it stems from. Um, you know, the, the, everything I feel kind of comes from our biology and our ability to pick things out health-wise, and if we see something that is disadvantageous um, to our health, we're going to perceive that, that negatively. But even in the realm of sport, you know, if you watch sprinters, there is a certain posture they have. They have proper posture. If you look at a, a football game or, or any sport, Posture is a crucial thing. If you once you see the posture break down, you're going to see a lack of functionality within the the running, within the sprinting. So you see a football player sprint down the field, and the head's thrown back, and the shoulders are in a weird position, and they're overarching their back. They're done. You know, they they've broken their posture. They're losing the proper format. You know, the chin should almost. You know, when you're watching someone run, the chin is almost slightly tucked. The not overly tucked, but, but in a neutral position. And the rest of the spine is in a very neutral functioning position, which allows that individual to properly activate the muscles. If you have a severe anterior pelvic tilt, which ties in with uh, lower cross syndrome, your abdominal section is going to be disengaged. Your rectus abdominis is overly stretched. Now your, your um, erectus spinatus muscles are overly contracted. And right there, it's throwing off your entire core. So you can't even properly train your core and actually develop uh, the muscles properly or, or build the six-pack that so many people want if you can't even get your pelvis into that neutral or slightly posterior position. Now, I'm not saying you want to walk on the posterior pelvic tilt. That's a whole separate issue. But that neutral pelvis is really what you need. And it's greatly overlooked today. And you get a lot of people, and I, I see you know so many posts on Instagram today. You know, we're in the era of, you know, especially with women, uh, you know, everyone wants to be thick. You know, that that's like the new the new culturally acceptable term. You know, every girl wants – not every girl. I'm, I don't want to generalize. But, but many women want to build up their butts. You know, for a while it was a smaller butt that people wanted. And today it's like I want the big booty. And, uh, you know, one way to kind of fake the big booty is through an anterior pelvic tilt by overarching your lumbar spine tilting your hips forward, it makes your butt look bigger. It's one of the reasons why women wear high heels. Uh, many times this forces them into an anterior pelvic tilt. They feel it makes the butt look bigger. It also makes the legs look longer, which ties into some other uh, biological stuff for, for attraction, you know, and how men perceive women. But, you know, it's become like the new cool thing, these anterior pelvic tilts. And I see many of these, you know, fitness models they have severe anterior pelvic tilts. Now, I don't know if it's just because they're posing or if they're constantly walking around like this, but many times I see these posts and these individuals, you know, they're posting all these workout videos and they end up taking a break and they'll say, oh yeah, having a problem with my lower back or having pain, having sciatica. Well, that's why. Because just because you look good, and looking good's great, but sometimes just the way you look does not also tie into how you function. Now, the person that functions the best will usually look the best. But people try to make shortcuts. So they try to shortcut the development of those glutes because that takes time. And many times, you know, you see these before and after pictures. If you actually look, the muscular size did not change very much. It was the way they were posing that changed. In the first one, they were in a different position. Now they're doing an anterior pelvic tilt, and now everything looks looks bigger. 
And again, we see this yeah, in the bikini competitions. If you watch bodybuilding, one of the things when they're up there doing some of their poses, they're very much tilting their pelvis anteriorly. So you know what? If you're a model or uh, you know you're a bodybuilder and you do the pageants, is it ideal for you in the long term with your training to have an anterior pelvic tilt? No. If you make your livelihood by posting pictures on Instagram, you know you, you got to do what you got to do. I'm I'm not gonna I'm not gonna discredit that. You know if if that's your choice, go for it. I'm not here to um, tell you not to do it. But for an athlete whose objective and livelihood is based on their function. I greatly encourage you to think about the importance of your spinal health. You know, it doesn't matter just how good you look in your uniform. It matters how you perform in your uniform. So you want to make sure that you're playing well. So if you're doing things in the gym that are causing this anterior pelvic tilt, many times these are created by people, partly because of our chairs. Um, We're not meant to sit in chairs. We're meant to squat. I always go back to the example of of this village I was in, Borneo. They didn't have chairs. They didn't have couches, they didn't have tables, they didn't have high toilets. Everything was on the floor. You sat on the floor, either cross-legged or in a squat. And there were people in their 80s, this 84-year-old shaman would just drop into a squat better than I could. He would sit there, he would eat a meal, he'd smoke a cigarette, and this guy had no problem because he had to do it every day. You know, in order to go to the bathroom, he had to squat. So most of these ailments that we've created in our bodies, we created on ourselves. We shouldn't need personal trainers or dietitians or chiropractors or strength coaches. In a perfect world, people would be able to take care of this on their own and not have these problems. But, you know, we are what we are and, and we're doing what we can to resolve it. But at least from your own standpoint, you know, if you're a coach listening to this, think about this for your athletes. You know, do a postural assessment. See if there's a, an issue or a potential issue and refer them to to the person that, you know, a chiropractor or, or other practitioner that can get these things taken care of before it becomes more of an issue. You know, same thing uh, if you're an athlete. You know, think about your health. If you're squatting continuously with an anterior pelvic tilt and you're not properly activating, creating intra-abdominal pressure when you're squatting, that's a problem. You might not notice it, but that's going to be creating an issue in the long term. So always think ahead and always think about how you can remedy these situations before they become something negative. Because you don't want to be the person that you're a great athlete, you're doing well, but because your back's hurting you, because you're squatting improperly, now you can't play and you lose that livelihood. Or you end up with a severe injury you have to deal with the rest of your life. So a lot of things going on here. Chiropractic, important stuff. Uh, I recommend it. I, I definitely think you should look into it and, and see if it's right for you. You know, I'm not going to blindly send everyone to a chiropractor, but if you feel that's a decision, it can't hurt to get an evaluation and see what's going on. It's amazing what's, you know, Dave was talking about some of the, the ways that he evaluates an individual. It's amazing what those x-rays and what these um, uh, other sensors can pick up. You know, he gives me printouts and shows exactly where the nerve irritation is, and it correlates many times to how I'm feeling. Uh, one of the most amazing things was looking at the x-ray and actually being able to see my vertebrae rotated, tilted, and just out of alignment. To, to actually get that visualization um, as to what was going on for me was huge and it allowed me to do different stretches and things to try to remedy it to some degree um, in, in conjunction with the adjustments and the other work I was doing. So it's definitely an interesting thing. Um, I, I think chiropractors made a lot of big strides, you know, back from the old day of the chiropractor putting up against the wall and cracking your back and you hear some of these stories. Um, it, it's definitely a different system today. And I, I think it's, we have a lot more to, a lot more positive things to look for. And I think there's a lot, we're an exciting time, I think, with the developments in how we perceive the body and how we take care of our body. So I really hope we keep moving in this positive direction. And I think practitioners uh, like Dave are really moving us in, in the right direction and continue to hopefully if you know more people can understand what's happening in their bodies and become more aware of their own health, I think that's the most important thing for trying to remedy the situation. So, um, you know, Dave, you never mentioned what, what got you into chiropractic. You know, wh- why did you become a chiropractor? What, what did you even, uh, you know, turned you on to this discipline? Was this something you always wanted to do? Well, I always wanted to be in a health profession. Uh, I always, at a young age, loved working out. Uh, didn't really take much medication. Didn't really feel like it was something that was natural to the body. It felt foreign to me. It didn't make sense. If I had a fever, the body was trying to fight something, and I let the body 
get a fever. It was never a thought in my mind to take Tylenol or to take medication to, to go against what my body was trying to do. Uh, it wasn't until I was in my final year at the University of Buffalo. I was an exercise science major and I was doing my internship at the University of South Florida. They had a, a, a football team I was an intern with and we were doing a, a drill where the, the players had to sprint through the drill and and they had to finish strong and one of them knocked over a cone so not thinking I just bent down to pick up the cone and before you knew it wham I got nailed head on and it knocked me out cold I was uh, taken to the hospital they did x-rays I think they even did an MRI they couldn't find anything wrong with me and I thought I broke my neck I thought I, I, I thought I was paralyzed because I couldn't move my right arm and I thought that if, if they couldn't help me, then I was going to have to live like that the rest of my life. Uh, long story short, I came back to the, the practice the next day, and I, and I said, you know what, let me go talk to the players. They've, they've got to have had something like this happen to them before. And sure enough, they said, oh, you know what, it sounds like you got uh, a stinger. And you know, go see the chiropractor. The chiropractor is the one who helps us the most when anything like this happens. And sure enough, the chiropractor took a look at the same x-rays, and determined I had subluxation in my spine and my neck, which was preventing me from being able to turn my neck. And that subluxation was compressing the nerves going down my right arm, which was preventing me from being able to move and feel my arm. And after a series of adjustments, not only did he get me functioning at 100%, but I was able to learn about chiropractic and how it can truly help uh, the situation and help the, the athletes get back in the game. And that's what, what woke me up to the point of the, 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 the chiropractic philosophy. And I went to chiropractic school after that. And now I've dedicated my life to helping others, hopefully wakening them up and helping them uh, avoid surgery and avoid unnecessary medication. That's a great story. I always, I always love hearing those origin stories, you know, if you will. So guys, thanks for joining us today. Um, here at the Strength Coach Freeman podcast, Dave, thanks, thanks for being on, um, and and giving us a lot of insight as to what chiropractic is and and how it can be used to benefit um, individuals as well as athletes. And for those athletes and coaches out there, I hope this kind of brings a new perspective to what you've been doing in in terms of the training. You know, it's not just how big or, or how well functioning your muscles are. If the structure that your muscles move are not functioning properly, there's going to be some level of dysfunction and, and loss of ability and increase of risk of injury. So don't only, don't just look things, for, you know, from the standpoint, you know, you know, how much can I squat? How far can I jump? Look at the body as a holistic unit. You know, look at, at the underlying structures as well. There should be a, a back and forth. There should be multiple perspectives. And if you see someone having trouble somewhere and they're not achieving the goal they're trying to achieve, Maybe it's not just because they're not strong enough. Maybe there's other factors at large that we need to evaluate and look at. So I hope this allows you to kind of look at uh, either yourselves or your athletes from a new perspective to help minimize the risk of injury and optimize their athletic performance. Because at the end of the day, that's what it is uh, to be a strength and conditioning coach, uh, to work with your athletes. Dave, thanks for having me on. Thanks for having me, and I want to thank Mark for, for what he's doing for the chiropractic profession, and we need more knowledgeable people like himself, more coaches like himself who are taking into consideration not just the muscular, the muscular system, but the skeletal system and how they're integrated and working together. Uh, so if I could uh, leave my little signature on this podcast, the, the last thing I would say to sum it all up is to work in before you work out. Well said, Dave. Well said. Uh, thanks for listening to the Strength Coach Freeman podcast and tune in soon for more podcasts dealing with everything strength and conditioning.